What is up guys, Pizza here obviously, and today we are here with Star Trek Infinite. Yes, the absolutely worst promoted video game this year because nobody had any idea it was coming out. Not even me until like, I don't know, a month ago? And, well, yeah, it kind of shows that why they didn't push it too hard because it's a little buggy right now. Uh, for many people, this is all you're getting on the faction screen is nothing. I got that issue today. Still don't know how to fix it. Nobody has a fix yet. I assume this will be patched in the coming weeks, which is the thing that this game needs a lot of right now, is a lot of patches. So if you want to buy it right now, go ahead. But honestly, I would wait another month or two. But for those of you who do not want to wait that long, I'm going to show you a little bit of the tutorial. This is the tutorial map that I have been playing on. The tutorial is pretty open-ended. It starts you off with a few basic mission, introduces you to the basics of the game, and then lets you run wild and do whatever you want. It starts just after the Kittimer Crisis, so it's really set the board pretty blank for everybody. As you can see, the board is extremely big. You can colonize a lot of places and explore a lot of places. So far, all I have done is slowly make my way out as I'm learning the mechanics of the game, slowly scan some areas, and I sent one science ship all the way up here, just, just because you can. Other ships, like the warships, your construction ships, and your colony ships are all restricted to a certain amount of space. See, this little blue line, this is how far pretty much all of your ships can travel. And you have to have built star bases in each of these systems to expand it ever more and ever more. Science ships, however, can just go wherever they want. And there is one exception. The Cerritos, if you pre-ordered like I did, the Cerritos can go as far as you want it to. So I've got one science ship going out that way, and while this is a military ship, it also has science functions, which makes it really great to double up. So this one is just going way out over here to colonize some other places. The things that will most commonly happen beginning as the Federation is the Betazoids down here will offer you friendship, alliance, protection, and trade routes, which is really vital early on. What I did as well is I also opened up a lot of trade and reception with Bajor. I tried to work with the Cardassian Union, but the Cardassian Union, even after we opened borders, immediately shut that down. So they are, as usual, not the greatest faction to be friends with. The Romulan Empire has stayed out of pretty much everybody's business so far. And the Klingon Empire I am just now starting to warm up to, but that is because I have resolved the Kittimer Crisis. You have the neutral zone in here, which is ranked as an unidentified empire, which is the Draken Empire as far as I am aware. You can send ships into it though without any issue. You can send ships into the Romulan Star Empire if you want. That just, nobody cares. Nobody cares. Don't know why. I felt like I would get an automatic war if I moved in there. I didn't. The Romulans didn't care. And obviously over here you have some non-playable factions as well. You can pl technically play as one, two, three, four of these factions, however, it's 50-50 on it whether you're actually going to be able to play as them or not. I had planned to play as the Klingon Empire tonight, but the issue of choosing factions was still not fixed. However, down here we have the Hyperion Autocracy, is how I'm going to pronounce it, and they have become my friend. I have that? opened trade with them, I am not in war, and it was a very diplomatic first contact. Up here, however, in the Yara system, I also made first contact with a different species. In fact, I am still making first contact with them, which is one of the really cool things. These events are really neat. I enjoy seeing these. So, so as you can see here, I have two options for how to continue my first contact with them. I can suggest an exchange program, which gives me a lot of unity, which is used to unlock new traditions, memorials, yada, 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 or accept a gift, which is energy credits, which you really need these. More than anything else, you need these. As you can see, I'm running real close right now in trade, or er, in what I'm consuming and what I'm producing. So I really could use this more than anything else. Plus, I started out this first contact by giving them a gift, so it's only fair that I take a gift in return. Now, I'm sure everybody's wondering, well, Pizza, how does this play compare to Stellaris? It plays really similarly. In fact, the only complaint I've seen a lot of people making is that it's like the Stellaris, the Star Trek mod for Stellaris, but really toned down and still needs some working up, which, I gotta be honest, 
I kind of agree with, but I love it because it's still simplistic enough that even I can get into it. So if you've never played a Paradox game before, if you've never played Stellaris before, this is a great time to jump in because it's still simple enough that you won't get overwhelmed, especially if you play the tutorial. So here is the Bajoran Republic still under the command of Cardassia. And just to run through a couple of things that you can do with these people. So early on, when Bajor was still an independent power in the very beginning of the game, me, the Romulan Star Empire, and the Klingons all guaranteed them independence. And now that is something that we cannot break because it is locked, because now they are not an independent power anymore. We can insult them, which basically just says well, they're gonna hate us. We can revoke support for the independence of the Bajor Bajorans, but we're not going to do that. Liberate the subject? We could just begin a war against the Cardassian Union at any time to do this, but I don't think that's a good idea yet. Or we could improve relations, which is what I have already done. I sent this guy out at the very beginning of the game to improve relations with the Bajorans. So far, it really hasn't done anything for me, especially because the Cardassians closed off their borders and trade to us, but at the beginning of the game, it was kind of helpful. Daggers talk, money howls. The Klingons, however, we obviously have a lot more to do with. And we can see the relations over here. They're weary with us, and that's mainly because we decided to share intelligence, and we've worked together so far. We could form a non-aggression pact, however, because that Red X, they're really not likely to accept it at this time. We can still do it on the off chance that they will, but it's not likely. We can also offer them a trade deal, declare war, harm relations, improve relations, create trade agreement, or recall our embassy. I have already established an embassy with them, so I don't have to worry about that. That really helps improve relations and our intelligence gathering as well. And the Romulan Empire. They're not entirely closed off in this game, which it feels like they're really should be. It feels like they should kind of attack me on site, but they don't. We're actually very open with each other. I have about the same level with them as I do the Klingons. I can also have all the same options. However, even the embassy, they are unlikely to accept at this time because I have done so little to actually impress them. If you go into one of the systems, and in fact this is the first screen you will see of the game, you start out like this. Basically you get to see all of the little planets and stuff. You can manage the minutia of everything just like you can other Paradox games. You've got your major starbase, which is basically your major military base, where you can build science ships, which research systems, which you have to do. Every system you send out has to be fully surveyed, every single planet, before you can do anything else with it. Construction ships? mainly are useful for building star bases and mining facilities. Star bases are how you expand how far your civilization can warp to, as I showed you earlier. It also allows that system to be placed with inside the borders of your territory. Colony ship further reinforces that. It allows you to colonize a planet. Basically, you get a new system with new resources and new people who can work it. And then this Miranda class, the Challenger design, is more of your military. You can upgrade it later. I, however, have not been able to do that as of yet, but this is your basic military ship that you get at the start of the game. You can also do all the neat micromanagement stuff you can do in other games. You can see unemployment. There are no unemployment population members on this planet. You can upgrade their mining districts, their energy districts, industrial, city, agriculture, and culture, depending on what you want it to do. Down here are buildings, which help um, edit a lot of factors. I haven't found them too useful yet, but with this being the tutorial mission, I really don't think they're going to be that useful. I have started building them up in some areas. As you can see, my stability is not great, which means I do need to put a little more effort into these places that I already call home, already call colonized colonies. But at this time, it really hasn't been that useful. I'm sure when stability gets a little lower, it'll hurt me worse. But right now, it's certainly manageable, especially if I start a war with anybody small enough that I'll be able to win. That'll give a big boost to unity and it'll give a boost to stability as well. However, with that being said, pizza, what does war look like? Well, hmm, let me show you what war looks like. I'm going to go ahead and unpause the game so that I can build a starbase in this system. I have scanned it, so now I'm going to build a starbase here which will allow me to jump into the Hyperion Autocracy sector. From there, I will send these two fleets. This Admiral I had to hire on my own, which let me go over here. There is a lot of stuff. There's a mission log, which is basically things you can do to complete, to get rewards, and to continue through the tutorial. There are contacts, which is basically everybody you've made contact with. There's the market, planet management, expansion planner, 
edicts and policies, which is really slimmed down. I wish there was a little more you could do here. Traditions. Traditions are basically how you want your society to develop. You can focus on defense, conquest, research, development, welfare, and commerce. As the IGN article a month or so ago put it, if you play as the Federation, you really want to roleplay like you're playing the Federation. So I've put everything into development so far because these things weren't things that were important and it is much more important that I develop rather than going after anything else right now. You have your ship designer, your fleet manager, and your technology, and your species and leaders. These aren't as important. The leaders, however, is how you get things commanding. Governors are basically stability boosts. You send them to a planet that's low in stability, and they can increase the stability, or they can increase the production. That's all they're good for. Scientists for the Federation are the thing you're going to need the most, because you need a lot of science ships, and you need a lot of people researching things. Like, this guy is busy leading engineering research, so whatever engineering research project I have now, he's going to be the one leading it. Admirals. Admirals are also important because these are the only way you will control your military ships with any degree of true power. Here I have Iria Shan, and I have Necheyev. Necheyev was a random event admiral that I got. Event here and there, you will get the chance to recruit different characters from the series. Necheyev was the first one I got, so I recruited her to my second fleet. There's also spies over here, but they're really not important, especially the default spy. I'm honestly thinking of disbanding this fleet because it's just not that useful at all. So I'm going to go ahead and send both of these fleets into their home system, and then I'm going to declare war on them and show you what it's like. Because I could go to this black hole, but as I found out while playing earlier today, there is the most massive fleet of death and destruction in that black hole. If I have any advice to anybody playing this game right now, don't go towards that black hole. There is like, I don't know, 50,000 worth of military power in there of an unknown species. And nobody is going to get that high, at least not for another like 20 years. So avoid this black hole at all costs. And now that I have a fleet fully into this sector, now we can really focus on some warfare. What will really determine how well you're going to do in any kind of engagement is this. This little fire icon next to it is basically just your military strength of this fleet compared to another fleet. So these are 7, 54, 43, and this guy is 335. Pretty strong. I've also got a 102 and a 55 coming to back up as well. So kind of feel like we've got this war in hand, especially because for as long as it's taken me to get here, they haven't had anyone else to trade with. We were their one and only trade partner. So with nobody else in contact with them and nobody else to trade with, their economy took an immediate hit. And this is basically where your wars will end up in the end, is determining how much did you do? How much did they do? Who really won? Who really lost in this war? And eventually, sometimes, they will even sue for peace themselves, especially if you complete your actual war goal. So we can just go back to settling for the status quo, which results in a white peace. Nothing changes, nobody gets anything, that's basically it. Or you could create a neutral zone, but it's only valid with major players, so the Klingons, the Romulans, the Cardassians, or you can just flat out surrender, no matter how well you did. If you just want to surrender to them, you can. And you can take whatever comes with that. But yeah, those are really the major parts of Star Trek Infinite right now. It needs a lot of work. It needs a good lot of work. And it probably won't truly be ready to play until a month or two from now. But is it worth the is it worth the cost? Well, 100% it is. I think this is 100% worth the cost. It is 30 or $40 right now. That's a great price for a four times grand strategy game especially a Star Trek one. I say go out and get it. I say go out and get it, have absolute fun with it, let the mods roll in, let the bug fixes roll in. I'm sure they'll be here before even the next week or before the month is out. But that's going to do it today, guys. If you enjoyed this, please be sure to leave a like. If you enjoyed listening to the sound of my voice or you want to catch up on the other stuff I'm doing on the channel, drop a sub. It really helps out. That's going to do it today, guys. I will talk to you all later. Bye!